Well, it all depends. Practically every communication uh, that we have from higher dimensions, you could say, is in one way uh, or other channeled. Now, you may call it divine inspiration or the, the Holy Spirit speaking through someone, but um, I think channeling as a phenomenon, as a way of getting information from the higher levels in the hierarchy is a very well-established uh, fact. Now, now, what may be coming through those channels, I think we have to you know, judge, because sometimes you may be getting disinformation. I, I think this happens in many of the uh, uh, UFO communication uh, uh, well, it, happen, it happens in all related fields, I'm sure. Right. Michael, I'm sure. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I have just t I have two quick questions. All right. Where, where are you? Uh, Tacoma, Washington. Tacoma. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Um, earlier, uh, you guys said that uh, we've been, as humans, existing on the Earth uh, with all the creatures, including Bigfoot. Yes. And... Uh, I was wondering what he thinks of some of the stories that I've heard uh, about Bigfoot in connection with uh, UFO sightings. All right. Yes, well, I was alluding to that uh, before. I was saying that we can't consider these creatures simply to be uh, just sort of like big apes. They seem to have, uh, some of them have powers that go beyond what normal animals would be expected to have and there is indeed quite a literature on reports of these creatures in connection well as long uh, as we're as long as we're on the subject michael you keep taunting me with that powers they seem to have powers for example well it's very unusual that uh none of them have ever been captured uh, well, so you mean powers alive. powers of eluding uh, hunters right powers for uh, eluding hunters uh, also having been uh, cited in uh, connection with uh, these uh, UFO objects. Also, if you look at traditional accounts from the American Indians of these creatures, that uh, they uh, tend to manifest some mystic powers, as do many of the other a animals uh, that may be uh, uh, mentioned. Okay, well, with respect to the UFOs, I guess it would make sense, Michael, that they would keep track of uh, one species, or Bigfoot, along with human beings who have been abducted and uh, animals uh, that we consistently hear uh, uh, are abducted for one reason or another. So if your theory, if, if one accepts your theory, then it would make sense that uh, UFOs uh, would... Um, monitor these creatures as much as they might monitor us, only there would be far fewer of them. Uh, so I guess all that would uh, make some sense. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hi. Hello. Uh, this is Jack from Charleston, South Carolina. Hi, Jack. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask your uh, guest if he knows the air date of the sightings program that he said he uh, uh, taped a couple of weeks ago. That's a good question. And oh, that, also, that show, uh, I, I'm sorry. I... That show has already aired. It aired um, uh, this past uh, winter. I forget what day it aired. But oh, I it, usually it, check. It's, it. already, it's already been on, on the air. All right, already I will, been on. I will, uh, I will mention, however, that I'm now working on a, uh, as a consultant to, for one of the major networks for a, uh, uh, a television special. I can't reveal too much about it, but uh, it'll be coming out in the fall. <laughs> All right. Uh, and also, I want to ask quickly, um, I went to tell someone in my house... Uh, what you were already talking about, and it came back, you mentioned about something about too bad about Dr. Uh, Professor Mack. Is that that John Mack, the one who did alien investigations? Uh, right. Yeah, what yes, were you sir. saying about him? Uh, uh, well, okay. Um, I hate to have to go over it again, but basically uh, Harvard is um, uh, challenging Dr. Mack's uh, credentials and area of investigation, and uh, there's going to be some hearings or something. Is that is that about right, Michael? That's right. Yeah, he's 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 uh, the, the charge is is that he's been acting irresponsibly as a scholar in in suggesting that uh, there may be actual some actual truth behind these stories of alien abductions. So there you are, Wildcard Line. You're on the air with Michael Cremo. Good evening. Hello, this is Fritz from Phoenix. Yes, Fritz. 
Well, over and over again, there's one mystery that baffles mankind for so many years, and I'm sure every one of you listening to these radio audience here is aware of it, that the Yeti or the abominable snowman, Sasquatch, or the Bigfoot definitely has a connection with the UFO. In my opinion, they're all under the umbrella of the extraterrestrial presence, and mm -hmm. they were brought here to our planet for whatever reason. Michael, can you accept that? Well, that is uh, Michael's theory of uh, well, how I, we got I would here. say that we all have an extraterrestrial origin if we trace it back far enough. Uh, all of the creatures on this planet, and it, it may be uh, quite a complex series of events that led to all of the creatures on this planet being uh, placed here. I wonder why uh, the extraterrestrials decided to put so many varieties of uh, human beings here. Any thoughts on that? Well, it, it would appear that, uh, there, now, from ancient Sanskrit writings, we learned that there are 400,000 human species scattered throughout the universe. Uh, so we may uh, be get, and, and it, it would appear also from the UFO literature that there are many types of um, uh, aliens. There are the, the standard grays, there are the uh, so-called Nordic type. Uh, it would appear that there you also have a, a variety. So uh, it, it doesn't surprise me that uh, we may have been visited uh, many times and that uh, the human history may be much more complex than we've been led to imagine. Michael, when you stick with simple uh, archaeology, when you simply challenge traditional scientific um, theories regarding how long we've been here and how we developed, uh, it seems to me you're on one ground. That's when, right. Uh, when you jump uh, to an explanation that involves extraterrestrials, then you put yourself in exactly the same position as Dr. Mack is now in, uh, and it makes, makes it much easier for the traditional scientific community uh, to throw fertilizer on your uh, whole theory. Yes? Well... They'll also try to uh, object to the uh, even the archaeological evidence, as you were suggesting earlier. Well, I know, but they hardly even have to bother with that, Michael. If, right. You know, given what you've given them, I mean, it it, should, it makes it easy for them, doesn't it? Well, I think there's another whole area of knowledge suppression going on, and that has to do with anything connected with uh, the paranormal or the extraterrestrial or that's the supernatural, true. whatever that's... whatever you want to call it. Well, that's what I'm saying, and, and... Uh, I think. Now, what I want to do is directly confront uh, the scientific community on those points, and I don't think I'm alone in this. We're, we're seeing, for example, you have in existence today an international society for the study of subtle energy medicine, which is composed of about 1,200 medical professionals and biologists that are looking at subtle healing and subtle energies. In other words... If we're going to have an alternative explanation of human origins, the first thing that we have to show is that there is more to the human essence than can be explained by chemistry, biochemistry. Indeed, it's, it's a very good point. Yes, sure. And we, you have the Institute for Noetic Sciences. You have many individual scholars who are courageously investigating these things. So uh, I see that there is, and it may sound like a cliche to say it, but there is a paradigm shift underway, and I think it's making a lot of progress. Well, I thought so, too, but hearing about Professor Mack makes me wonder. And uh, maybe you're underestimating the uh, resistance uh, that the traditional scientific community uh, will put up. It will be stiff, it will be strong, and it will virtually ridicule uh, people like yourself and uh, and John Mack and others. Well, they, these are the the standard tactics. The first the first line of defense is to try to ignore something. When you can no longer uh, try to ignore something, then you uh, ridicule it. Uh, that's right. And then and then if that doesn't work, then you get the uh, heavier kinds of suppression. Um, well, I think we have to look and see well, what would happen uh, in the case of uh, communism, for example. Right up to the last minute, they were in charge. Uh, yes. They were uh, still in charge, but uh, 
there was so much going on underground and around the sides that eventually the, the system collapsed, even though right up to the last minute. Uh, it, it, so you're, you're saying uh, right. tradi so think traditional think science, was, traditional science will collapse the way communism did all at once, nearly with no warning, boom, boom, the fences come down. Is that right? Because, because there are so many people who do not believe in it anymore. There are so many cracks in the consensus. There are so many independent scholars investigating these things and counter, uh, and as I said, so many organized attempts uh, by scholars uh, who, who are a little bit more independent to investigate these uh, subjects. So I think the combined weight of that will eventually bring about uh, a collapse of the current Paradigm. the current consensus. All right, it's uh, only been around for about two or three hundred years. I understand. All right, Michael, right. let's let's stay with the phones here. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hi. Hello. Hello. Where where are you, sir? Uh, Sarasota, Florida. Excellent. Go ahead. You're on the air. Okay. Uh, what uh, comes to my mind? I admit I missed about. Uh, half hour of your show here, but I'm thinking about uh, a photograph I saw that claims to be a sandal print with a crushed trilobite underneath, which predates most life forms on this planet by several million years. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, to recall. What you're talking about is the Meister footprint uh, discovered by uh, Robert Meister in Utah. Mm -hmm. And uh, my co-author, Richard Thompson, went and visited Mr. Meister. Um, he's no longer living, but uh, at the time he was living. And we obtained uh, photographs, our own photographs of those footprints. Now, those footprints were discovered in Cambrian Shale in Utah. And uh, that rock in which those uh, uh, sandal prints were found is roughly uh, 600 million years old. And as, as uh, I've pointed out several times, according to what the scientific elite will tell us today, human beings like us have only been around on this planet about 100,000 years. As a matter of fact, 600, 000, 600 million years ago, they, they would say there was no life. Something was wearing shoes. <laughs> on, on, the, on, the, on the surface of the earth at all. Maybe there would have been some... Uh, uh, marine creatures, just life in the ocean. Uh, Michael, what about those, those what, prints what, are there? And we did a computer analysis of them. We uh, we found that the the shape of that uh, print did not deviate in the slightest from a modern human shoe print. Uh -huh. Michael, what about the possibility that that print was somehow somehow put in that older rock in more recent times? How do you discount that possibility? Well, from uh, the, the testimony of the person who discovered it, who said uh, he was a rock collector, and he was uh, going through an area with one of those little uh, geologist picks, or, yes. you know, and he was breaking open. He was looking for trilobites, so he was, which are those little fossils of these uh, little shellfish. Sure. And he was breaking open solid pieces of this rock. Mm. So it, it couldn't. It was not something that somebody could have carved into, I, I've got you. into a rock like that. Okay, I've got you. Yeah. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hi, where are you calling from, please? This is Dave in Wichita. Hello, I, Dave. I wondered if Michael had heard about the age of the Sphinx being uh, at least 10,000 years old and that some evidence in the Purnas, the ancient Indian writings, uh, say that it's about 100,000 years old. All right, the right. Sphinx. Dave, uh, I'm very familiar with that. You're talking about the work of uh, Dr. Robert Schock, who is a geologist at uh, Boston University. He analyzed the Sphinx, the weathering uh, uh, of the Sphinx, and uh, determined that it was far older, many thousand years older, than uh, current Egyptologists would say. And here's, I'll, 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 I'll tell you about how this uh, knowledge suppression uh, factor operates. He wants to go back and conduct further, uh, further uh, studies, but the uh, antiquities department, you know, the, the government of uh, Egypt, uh, the, the, the uh, department in charge of that, that uh, those uh, monuments will not let him go back right at the present moment.